Welcome to our Ask Gun Questions podcast series about at Radio Free America, and this is Uncle Sam with Music and the Truth Until Dawn. Right now, I've got a few words for some of our brothers and sisters in the occupied zone. The chair is against the wall. The chair is against the wall. John has a long mustache. John has a long mustache. It's 12 o'clock, Americans, another day closer to victory. And for all of you out there on or behind the lines, this is your song. And welcome, everybody, to our Daily Gun Show. Going to be live every weeknight at midnight Eastern, and we talk about guns for about an hour or so. So uh, tonight is Wednesday, and on Wednesdays, we typically do our tactical quiz. Tonight, we're actually doing an actual tactical quiz. So unless someone else shows up to participate, it looks like Jacob is the winner for being the only one here tonight. We'll wait a couple of minutes here and we'll see who might want to participate in our tactical quiz and then we'll get started here so let's see we go live every midnight or every weeknight at midnight so that's live as opposed to a uh, program show or some kind of uh, scripted produced video uh, we go live do this thing for real this is episode 1500 and something or another our goal is to go live every weeknight at midnight so that we have this time slot and we're not really bothering anybody here and we have the night to spread out and go long. Uh, we would ideally talk about 2A for the first bit of the show, dig into just gun topics throughout the night and then whenever the show's getting ready to end, we would wrap it up with uh, a preview for the next day. So if you're interested in being part of that, uh, we're looking for sponsors and you can be a uh, subscriber to our projects over on Patreon. So uh, again, we're doing a tactical quiz tonight. We've got Tara out there and Jacob. Are you both playing tonight? Anybody can play, anybody can win, or nobody could win and nobody could play. Uh, how's the little dog doing? He's doing all right. I've been uh, attempting to file his little nails because he's a big jerk about getting his nails cut. So he's not digging this. Getting a little file going because the nails are so long. It's a little better than the uh, cutting. You can handle it a little better. So we could just sit here watching me file my dog's nails if you want. Or we could have a tactical quiz. We got a 25 question tactical quiz getting ready here. Uh, we'll start it off, I guess, with a little bit of a uh, sample quiz. We're going to start with a 10 question quiz about revolvers. Okay. Uh, then we'll all uh, be doing the real quiz here in a second.
may just ask my best friend over here what the uh, thing is. So it's the first one. What's a revolver? Boom, go. Uh, who is commonly credited with inventing the revolver? Boom, go. What is the advantage of a revolver over a semi-automatic? Boom, go. Who's winning these? Uh, what's the difference between a single action and a double action? These are the kind of questions you might encounter if you were playing the actual quiz. But this is a sample warm-up quiz. That's a six-shooter. What is a six-shooter? Next one. What's the timing of a revolver? What is that all about anyway? What's the timing of a revolver all about? What if you wanted to file a dog's nails and he hated it so much that he wouldn't even give you his little baby foot? Not a big fan of it. Not a big fan of it. So uh, anybody playing tonight on the tactical quiz? Those were some sample questions on the what it comes up with here. There we go. What does the acronym... Now, those questions were just practice questions. We're trying to see who's playing tonight. So here's how we'll play it. Uh, since nobody's jumping in to join, we'll, uh, we'll just say whoever does the right answer first wins right that round or no you know what we're going to do this time we're doing it a whole different way puppy we're doing it a different way even though he's the co-host i'm making this decision you know who's winning tonight everybody with the right answer there's no way to keep track of this though so i guess i can't do it that way we could do it with everybody gets the right answer we'll see what happens so the first question is what does the acronym cqb stand for is it close quarters bombing? Is it combat quell bomb? Is it quick combat quick break or close quarters battle? And I'm not going to repeat the answers. So DJ is saying A, close quarters battle. DJ wins. All right. So uh, that was pretty easy. We'll put a star next to DJ. We'll just play it this way. All right. Next one is. What is the purpose of a flashbang grenade? Is it to provide cover and concealment? Is it to disorient and distract? Is it to break through barriers? Or is it to provide a smoke screen? Is it A, cover and concealment? B, disorient and distract? C, break through? Or D, Provide a smoke screen. Uh, let's see. It's very difficult to keep track of. So uh, I wrote the answers. I hope you see them. So we got an A to cover and concealment. No. To disorient. Yes. So that's another one for DJ. All right. So here we're putting a line down. Every time I put a line down, quit ans answering it because it's for the next one already. So this one will be for answer number this one. What is the difference between cover and concealment? Is it A, 
Cover offers protection from bullets and other projectiles, while concealment only hides the individual from view. Or is it B, cover hides an individual from view while concealment provides protection from bullets and projectiles? Is it C, both cover and concealment offer protection from bullets? Or D, neither cover nor concealment provide protection from bullets? Would that be A, B, C, or D? We actually have a right answer. From DJ. So is everybody else playing tonight or is DJ just on uh, some kind of better internet connection and everybody? What's happening tonight? We're going to try putting some equal signs across here and get to the next question. This is a tactical quiz. So you, when you show up to a tactical quiz, you got to be ready for a tactical quiz, in my opinion. All right, so this one's lame. Everybody should be able to get this one. DJ, I don't think, has any advantage, even though DJ... May or may not have been on the SWAT team, I guess. What are the four rules of the gun safety? Is it A, treat every firearm as it's loaded, never point a firearm, anything you're not willing to destroy, keep your finger on the trigger until you're ready to shoot and be unsure of your target and what's beyond, or B, unsure of your target and what's beyond it, or is it, oh, come on, I have to read all this every time. Is it be sure of your target and what's behind it? Or is it be unsure of your target and what's behind it and keep your finger? That's ridiculous. We're not even doing that one. It is A. Jacob gets that one. So, that, or no, King Henry. So, King Henry gets that one. I can uh, only show you what's happening on my screen. Oh, I guess I can't show you what's happening on my screen. So, let's see. The next one is what does the acronym... I'm just going to leave it like this. I'm not going to make this one letters. The first one who correctly puts the answers in here wins. What does the acronym OODA stand for? The OODA loop. Some people would call it the OODA loop. What does OODA stand for? Am I on the wrong tube? No. I think you can both be on whichever YouTube. I just, uh, I'm broadcasting it on two channels, but you can answer from either of the two channels. Right now, the question is, what does the acronym OODA stand for? Oh man, I didn't think about it. If everybody is, a, that's why nobody shows up for this show, because this dog is so menacing that he's scaring people away. Sorry about that. I'll, uh, I'll do his nails a little bit. That'll make him look less menacing, like he has less claws. He don't mind me doing his back foot. He just doesn't like the front foot. Oh, wait, we already have something over here. We have observe, orient, decide, act. Pretty good. So DJ got that one before anybody else is even answering it. Well done. Um, what is the purpose of a breaching charge? What is the purpose of a breaching charge? Is it A, to disorient and distract, B, to break through barriers, C, to create a smoke screen for cover and concealment, or D, to protect individuals from bullets and projectiles. What's the purpose of a breaching charge? Pretty standard question for a tactical quiz, I'd say. Is anybody else playing tonight, or is it just DJ? So it looks like King Henry got that one, though. So uh, DJ thinks he's so good, but... King Henry got that one on my screen before DJ. All right, we're putting a line across here now. And this is the next question. The next question is, what is the purpose of a smoke grenade? This one's stupid. So it's not my fault that these are stupid. Robots make these questions. Uh, what's the purpose of a smoke grenade? To disorient and distract potential threats? That's A. B, to provide cover and concealment. 
by creating a smoke screen. B, okay, or C, to break through barriers with your smoke grenade, I guess. Or D, to protect individuals from bullets and other projectiles. Is it A, to disorient and distract with the smoke grenade? Or is it B, to provide cover and concealment with a smoke screen? Or is it C, to break through things with smoke? You know, nine millimeter shooters, you could probably break through a bunch of them with smoke. Or D, break or protect individuals. It looks like the answer is actually B. Got to be lagging. We know what somebody's lagging. A lot of B's in there. A lot of B answers. But DJ was the first B, I believe. So DJ gets that one. What I'm doing is I'm starring the people. Uh, I don't know how many answers we're up to, but here's how it's breaking down at this point. One, two, three, four, five for DJ, two for King Henry. You know, there's probably other tactical quizzes that happen every single week, and they probably hold your hand. Like if this is you taking the tactical quiz, those other ones probably hold your hand. Sometimes they probably just carry you through and let you do everything for you. Not on this one. On this one, you're out for on your own. You got to be competing with the likes of DJ out there. So we're not holding your hand for this one. We're not carrying you along. We're not slipping your answers. Uh, let's see. DJ says he's actually a donut. I don't give up. Okay. Uh, don't give up, man. When you giving up to DJ, DJ's half assing it. He's he's call he's phoning in half of these answers. You don't want to give up somebody like that. So here's the next question. What is the 21 foot rule? What is the 21 foot rule? Uh, is it A? The di see, a lot of people are answering these too soon, right? You shouldn't answer it that soon. You should wait until you hear the answers. Maybe there's something about these answers. A, the distance with an individual with a knife can reach and harm someone before a person with a gun can draw and fire in self-defense. Or is it B, the distance at which an individual with a gun what the hell, can reach and harm someone before a person with a knife can defend themselves? <laughs> robots are stupid. I can't help it if robots are stupid. And then the distance, or is it C, the distance at which person can run 21 feet under 1? 0.5 seconds, or is it D, the distance which a person can accurately fire a gun? Now, if it's a distance at which a nine millimeter is accurate and uh, effective, quote unquote, effective, it might be a tougher question. Puppy, what do you think it is? What's the answer? The answer is, in fact, the 21 foot rule is A. I don't know, it'd be before unholstering and firing. Um, yeah, I guess that's a way to say it. But it is, in fact, A, DJ gets it again. Tara said knife, which was close getting there, but you had to wait for the whole thing. B, because it's funnier, yes. Uh, don't like this pug too much, because one thing, he's bad a lot of times. A lot of times this dog is bad. He doesn't look like he's bad all the time, but a lot of times this dog is bad. And he stinks a lot. A lot of times he stinks. So he looks really good on video. Doesn't look like he's being bad or nothing, but he's bad a lot. He doesn't want to talk about it, but he is. All right, so the next one is what? Okay, come on. Seriously? So this is the next one. You know, I could have said the 21 foot rule is guidance used by law enforcement personnel to determine the safe distance from a knife wielding suspect. The rule states that a person with a knife can cover 21 feet in about 1.5 seconds, which is the average amount of time it takes for a person to draw a gun and fire. Before that, the smoke grenade, a non-lethal device that emits a cloud of smoke is designed to obscure an individual's view and provide cover and concealment. So what is, the next one is, what is, come on. Oh, okay, still gone. What is the stop 
the bleed campaign? Is it A, national awareness campaign to teach individuals how to recognize and respond to life-threatening bleeding? Is it B, a campaign to reduce the use of firearms in the United States? Is it C, a campaign to promote healthy eating and exercise habits, like don't eat razor blades? Or D, a campaign to reduce the number of accidents in the workplace? What is Stop the Bleed campaign? Oh, Roy, essentially grabbing it away from DJ, who was right there next to him, trying to grab it. But uh, Roy grabbed that one deftly away. Um, all right, so the next one is, what is the difference between a flash, let me put a thing right here, so that everybody knows this is the differentiation between that last one and this new one. What is the difference between a flash hider and a muzzle brake? Is it A, a flash hider reduces the recoil and muzzle rise, while a muzzle brake reduces the visible flash from a firearm's muzzle? Or is it B, a flash hider reduces the visible flash from a firearm's muzzle, while a muzzle brake reduces the recoil and muzzle rise? Or is it C, a flash hider and a brake are the same thing? Or is it D, a flash hider and a muzzle brake are both used for decoration purposes by nine millimeter shooters? Oh, I shouldn't put that on there because then that would make that an actual answer. So we got a difference of opinions on this one. So this one, uh, which is the difference? We got DJ with a B, Tara with a B, Jacob with an A, King Henry with a B. It is in fact the B. Uh, flash hider reduces the visible flash from a firearm's muzzle. A flash hider reduces the visible flash from the muzzle while a muzzle brake reduces the recoil's muzzle rise. A, hide, a flash hider is a device attached to the end of the barrel that reduces the flash that is produced when a round is fired, while a brake is designed to reduce the recoil by diverting the expanding gases. Um, the next one is fairly easy. So we're going to put some lines over here so that everybody can have a fair shot at this question, which is, well, which is what is the purpose of of a ballistic shield is it uh, to provide cover and concealment for individuals by creating a smoke screen is it to break through barriers such as doors or are you serious is it to stop bleeding or is it to provide protection during high-risk situations the stupid ass question i'm not counting that one nobody gets credit for that one because that's a stupid ass robot question doesn't understand how humans are. Uh, so see, let's see. Let's keep going to the next ones here. What's the purpose of a grappling hook? I don't know if people know what grappling hooks are anymore. Uh, back in the olden days, we used to use grappling hooks all the time to assist with doing cool stuff because we lived that kind of lifestyle. Nowadays, I don't think kids even grapple. Or if they do, it's in some kind of a Brazilian jiu-jitsu way. So uh, what is the purpose of a grappling hook? Is it A, to assist in climbing and repelling? Is it B, to break through barriers such as doors and walls? C, to provide cover and concealment? Or D, to protect individuals from bullets and projectiles? These are the worst questions in, alter in multiple choice ever, is all I'm saying. Uh, let's see. The purpose of the gappling hook is indeed, as GJ has won, uh, to assist with climbing and repelling. A uh, gappling hook is a device consisting of a hook attached to a rope or chain used to assist with climbing and repelling. Pfft, horrible description. Mm -hmm. 
these are bad. Uh, let's see. What is the difference between a tactical vest and a plate carrier? No, they're not. Yeah, I was way, doing way better at these. I agree. I think I was doing way better at these when I was writing them than when they have the robots write them because the robots can do it quicker than me, but they suck at it way more than when I was doing it. All right, so the next one is, what is the difference between a tactical vest and a plate carrier? And I go, answers that are not always A. And then, of course, it goes, a tactical vest is designed for comfort and mobility. The carrier is designed for maximum protection. B, a tactical vest is designed for maximum protection while a plate carrier is designed for mobility. Or a tactical vest and a plate carrier are the same thing. Or a tactical vest and a plate carrier both provide no protection. Stupid. So there you go. Pretty much a softball. Underhanded softball. There you go, Jacob. Grab that one. Right away from DJ. Uh, let's see. So... Okay, we got another one here. Maybe this one will be a little tougher. No one even answered that one. I don't blame you. So the next one is, what is the difference? Did we already do this one? What's the difference between a flashbang and a stun grenade? Did we already do this? A, well, uh, uh, a flash, is it A, a flashbang emits a bright light and a loud noise while a stun grenade emits a bright flash of light in a concussive blast? Or is it B, a flashbang emits a concussive blast while a stun grenade emits a bright light? Or is it a flashbang and a stun grenade are the same thing? Or flashbang and a bright emits a bright light while a stun grenade emits a loud noise? So a flashbang emits a bright light and a loud noise while a stun grenade emits a bright flash of light and a concussive blast? Or is it B, a flashbang emits a concussive blast while a stun grenade emits the bright light? Or is it C, the flashbang and a stun grenade are the same thing? Or is it A, or D, sorry, D, a flashbang emits a bright light while a stun grenade emits a loud noise? This one's a little tougher. I told it to start getting tougher, and then I threatened it by, I, but I'll, I, well, I won't tell you how I threatened, but I threatened the robot. And then, of course, it answers me. It gives me better answers. You know who's not out there this evening? Gizzard. What's up with that? So we have Jacob answering A, and DJ answering C, and no one else answering. So no one else knows what the difference is between a flashbang and a stun grenade. Turns out the answer is A. Jacob's right. Uh, while a, uh, both types of grenades are non-lethal, uh, used to disorient and distract potential threats, a stun grenade also produces a concussive blast that can cause temporary paralysis or disorientation. All right, so next question is... If we were in Germany, we would say the next question east. What is the purpose of a monocular? What is the purpose of a monocular? Do you even know what a monocular is? This is a tactical quiz. What is the difference? Or no, what is the purpose of a monocular? Is it A, to provide depth perception when using night vision devices? Is it B, to provide a wider field of view when using night, field, night vision devices? Is it C, to enhance the visibility in low light conditions? Or is it D, to magnify distant objects? Then what's the bang of a flashbang? Well, they're both gonna make a noise, but a flashbang is a lot of light and a loud noise, while a stun grenade is a bright light and a blast. Like it blows out a concussive blast, which knocks your ass down. At least it knocks mammals down. It can do some soft tissue stuff. So the monocular, we're getting pretty definitive answers with D. Magnify distant objects, correct. Here's the deal. Nobody else is playing. Right now it's just DJ and Jacob are 
you know, some kind of a playoff. Putting lines in here. It's anybody's game at this point because we stopped playing when the mouse party starts and we got like an hour. So you think we're done with tactical questions? Come on. So right now, DJ is definitely winning. But Jacob is now getting a bunch of questions on the board. He's got two. Roy's got one out there. King Henry has two. And then DJ has the rest. So uh, I guess everybody else, has everybody else just submitted to DJ? Just su su said to themselves, DJ is the more tactical of me and him. So I'm just giving this one to DJ. I, said, I suppose everybody is just saying DJ is more tactical than me. Now, if you're listening in the future, you're not listening live right now, but you're listening to this as a podcast in the future. Is DJ winning? Is DJ going to take this one home or are you winning at home? Let me know in the comments, I guess. All right. Are you ready? Oh, come on. Really? All right. So what is the difference... This one might not be for DJ. He might not be able to handle this one. So this one might not be just a gimme for DJ. Let's find out. What is the difference between a sniper rifle and a designated marksman rifle? DJ's more in tune with their robot mind. Uh, what is the difference between a sniper rifle and a designated marksman rifle? Is it A... A sniper rifle is more accurate and has a longer effective range than a designated marksman rifle. Is it B? A designated marksman rifle is more accurate and has a longer range than a sniper rifle. Or is it C? A sniper rifle and a designated marksman rifle are the same. Or is it D? A sniper rifle and a designated marksman rifle are both used for decoration purposes. Fucking robots suck. I'm putting a little down arrow thing on that. It's stupid. Um, so the answer is, in fact, A. Jacob grabbed that one without even... A, desig, a sniper rifle is more accurate and has longer range. It's highly accurate, designed for snipers to engage targets at extreme distances, while a designated marksman rifle is a medium-range rifle designed for use by designated marksmen within a squad or platoon. There's definitely room for interpretation. Yes, I agree. Uh, let's see. Look at how stupid the robot is. Tell me how stupid on a rate on a number of one to ten, how stupid this question is. Medium range is intermediate, it is between, I don't know, a hundred yards and four hundred yards, let's say, maybe. 300, 500 yards. All right, so what is the purpose of a door breaching shotgun? This is a fake question just to show you how bad the robot is. What your answer here is how bad the robot is. What is the purpose of a door breaching shotgun? Is it A, to create a hole or opening in a barrier allowing for entry or exit? Is it B, to provide cover and concealment for individuals by creating a smoke screen? Is it C, to protect individuals from bullets or other projectiles? Or D, to stop bleeding in an extremity? What the hell? Stupid robots, man. I feel like if I was trying to do this for a living and having robots do it for me, I would be fired. Well, I tried to do a uh, an interesting one there, but I think it's a little bit too much for the robots without uh, giving it a better uh, thing. So let's try a different one.
So I'm starting again with another uh, query to the uh, robot. Okay. So what does some DJ can pick what the topic for the next quiz will be since the uh, last quiz sucked. Uh, it tried to do good, but it probably had a few good answers in there, but it wasn't all that good. So we'll see if DJ gives us a, a good topic and we'll take that topic unless it's a bad topic and we'll thumb down the topic and we'll choose a different topic. So right now we're going to start another quiz. This is sort of like uh, that time, that intermediate time uh, when you're playing the video games where people are sitting around in between the rooms trying to figure out what game they're going to play next. First Aid Basics. Nah, how about First Aid Intermediate? Intermediate wilderness. All right. Create a 12 question multiple choice quiz about intermediate wilderness first aid with questions and answers. Include, include descriptions of the answers. Randomize the answers in the choices. Because I'm sick of it always saying the answer is A. You know what I mean? So it's starting. We're getting a pretty good list here. We're getting more, we're getting more, we're getting more, we're getting more. Uh, let's see, Roy is saying the worst tactical quiz is still better than the best regular quiz. Right on, appreciate that. All right, and then I'll say continue. Me and the robot are having a little fight right now, it's no big deal. All right, here it goes. All right, so we'll start off with the first one. We're going back to zero. DJ got, uh, he won the first one, hands down. It's kind of a shame. All of y'all should be embarrassed how much DJ wailed on you. I don't think anybody, if you stood up a line of people and said, pick the tactical people out of here, who's going to win the tactical quizzes? No one's going to pick DJ from that list, I don't think. And y'all lost to DJ pretty handily. So, well, again, a lot of other tactical quizzes are going to go, Oh, it's not your fault. Here's your here's your first place prize. Here's your participatory prize. Oh yeah, here's your free gun. Oh yeah, no problem. Here's your free gun. Take your free gun home. Thanks for playing. Even though you didn't win, take your free gun home. Sure, that's what it's like on a lot of the other tactical quizzes. Not on this tactical quiz. You're being challenged here. All right. What should be the first step when approaching a per a an injured person in the wilderness. What should be the first step when approaching an injured person in the wilderness? Is it A, call 911, B, assess the scene for safety, C, begin administering first aid immediately, or D, none of the above? So, what should be the first step when approaching an injured person in the wilderness. Is it A, call 911, B, assess the scene for safety, C, begin administering first aid immediately, or D, none of the above? I'll wait until we get three answers so that we don't wait forever. Hopefully people feel challenged to actually participate this time. This is actually good stuff. Uh, the robot AIs know health and medical way more than they know guns, so this should be a pretty good quiz. Uh, we only got two so far, so does that mean people are scared to answer or what? Too lazy to click on the thing? Click on the thing. Come on, click on the thing. Be part of this. You could win. Okay, there goes Roy winning. All right, so the uh, answer is, in fact, B. Nobody got it right. 
Jacob said, A, call 911. Nothing wrong with that. It's not a bad answer. D, I don't know what you're going to choose. C, administer first aid immediately. Be careful because there could be some something in the physically wrong, like uh, you know, some tree about to fall. Why is that person injured? Did they fall onto something? Is it a snake bite? Is the snake still there? So assess the scene for safety. You can't be useful if you're injured in a wilderness situation for sure. You know what I'm saying? Consent is one thing, but uh, in reality, in the wilderness, uh, consent is not the first thing you're going to worry about when you're diagnosing someone. So that's a great one. Uh, it says, uh, access the scene for safety. The first step in providing wilderness first aid is to ensure that the scene is safe for you and the injured person. Yeah, no worries. So the next one is, which of the following is a sign of shock? Which of the following things I'm about to say is a sign of shock? Very important. Is it A, warm and dry skin? Is it B, rapid breathing? Is it C, dilated pupils? Or is it D, slow pulse? So shock is something that your system will go through in uh, a lot of traumatic situations. It can sneak up on someone after the fact. It can happen immediately. It can uh, show ahead of time. Uh, it's essentially like an imbalance of your system. Uh, most of the time you need to lay down and most of the time face is pale, raise the tail, right? Raise the feet. Which of the following is a sign of shock? Warm and dry skin, A, B, rapid breathing, C, dilated pupils, or D, slow pulse. we got a couple of answers already. Jacob is saying B, DJ saying B, and Roy is saying D. So kind of two ends of the spectrum. The answer is, in fact, rapid breathing. Now, there are two different kinds of shock, but most shock is the rapid breathing. Uh, it is potentially life-threatening and occurs when the body doesn't get enough oxygen. Signs of shock can include rapid breathing, cool and clammy skin, dilated pupils, and a weak or rapid pulse. Or a weak rapid pulse, I should say. So it's actually B, so Jacob is grabbing that one. Well played. Next one. What is the proper way to remove a tick? That's a pretty good quiz because it's all over the place. What's the proper way to remove a tick? Now, this is going to be tough because I know people have their own ways of doing it or whatever. So the answers here are A, grasp the tick with tweezers and pull it straight out. B, burn the tick off with a lighter. C, use your fingers to flick it off. Or D, cover it with petroleum jelly. So uh, I know people have their own methods and people have their own urgency with ticks. Some people don't care about them and some people are super worried about them. It's usually if you've ever dealt with any of the problems that ticks give you. Ticks are horrible. You don't want to be around ticks if you can help it. So, all right, there's a lot of answers to this one. DJ picked A, Roy picked D, G picked burn, and then D, or I mean, Jacob picked D. I've heard of all of these before, uh, not so much the flicking, that's kind of pointless because we know that ticks burrow in a little bit or can be burrowed in or clamped on or whatever. Uh, but the answer according to this thing, which is, you know, it's a thing, it's an an answer, is, gra is A. Grasp the tick with tweezers and pull it straight out. When removing a tick, it's important to grasp it as close to the skin as possible with a pair of fine tip tweezers and pull it straight out. Avoid twisting or squeezing. I've had really good luck in the past with lighters. Just, you don't have to burn the tick. You hold the lighter upside down, you know how to do that. Hold the lighter upside down, let the lighter metal get hot like that and then touch that part to the to the tick. It doesn't burn you. You know, you can keep doing that. You know, it's going to blow the lighter up eventually, but you know what I mean? If you don't be a spaz, you can get the lighter pretty hot and then keep touching it. Uh, also, the, the, the petroleum jelly works great. I don't know why they didn't put that in there. It takes forever. It can take a while sometimes, but it will work. They get They suffocate and leave. 
Let's see. So which? So that's uh, hopefully this is interesting for people. But DJ did win that one. Well played, DJ. Uh, so I don't know if that's a tick experience thing or if that was a tick guess thing, or maybe he's read the comic book a bunch of times. So we've got another half an hour, a little bit more till the uh, mouse party, which is the show that follows this one that we uh, recommend you go check out if you're interested in some fine quality conversation in the middle of the night on an overnight. Uh, that's the place to check it out on Wednesdays. It's called the mouse party. All right, the next one is which of the following is not a sign of a concussion? Would it be which of the following is not a sign of a concussion? A, loss of consciousness, B, confusion, C, dizziness, or D, elevated blood pressure? Which would not be? So in other words, three of these are signs of a concussion. We got loss of consciousness, confusion, dizziness, and elevated blood pressure. We've got three answers for D, elevated blood pressure, which is not the sign of a concussion, correct? Blood pressure is not the sign of a concussion, uh, but the, the con uh, consciousness, confusion, dizziness, headache, nausea, vomiting, these are typical uh, indications of a concussion. So I guess DJ gets that one because he was the first. Quick on the draw. Let's see. The next one is, and I don't know how many people have to deal with this. We do it down here in Arizona. How do you treat a snake bite? How do you treat a snake bite? Is it A, cut open the bite and suck out the venom. B, apply a tourniquet above the bite. C, wash the bite with soap and water, or D, keep the affected limb immobilized and get the person to a hospital. So how do you treat a snake bite? And we're assuming a venomous snake bite here. A, cut open the bite and suck out the venom. B, apply a tourniquet above the bite. C, wash the bite with soap and water, or D, keep the affected limb immobilized and get them to a hospital. There's Gizzard, and there's G23. Let's see. So uh, we got a couple of answers already. So Roy is saying B, Jacob is saying B, DJ says D, and G23 is saying A. That's old-fashioned. We used to cut open them, but we don't anymore. Uh, the answer is, in fact, D, keep the affected limb immobilized and get the person to a hospital as soon as possible. It's not... Uh, a tourniquet can really cause some damage with a snake bite, so not a good idea. Uh, washing it ain't going to do nothing. Nobody picked that. But uh, ideally, you're going to splint it just like you would a broken limb and boogie. Get them to uh, some place where they can get anti-venom. It's not cheap, but uh, can do the job. So that's a, another one for DJ. Uh, let's see. Snake bites can be life-threatening. It's important to keep the affected limb immobilized, so sec effectively the least amount of circulation through it as possible, and then get them uh, medical attention as soon as possible. Um, sometimes I've heard of um, having the uh, limb raised, but I wouldn't recommend it. I'd just say try to keep them laying down and not, you know, not excited, trying to keep their blood from flowing as much as possible difficult they're going to get it stressed but um all right so next up uh gunmetal guy is out there good evening thanks for the thumbs up uh we're doing a tactical quiz everyone mastered it dj wailed on everybody by out tacticaling everyone so now we're doing a first aid uh actually it's a intermediate first aid uh, so not just wimpy easy first aid so the next question is, which of the following is the sign of a sprain? Which of the following is the sign of a sprained, you know, limb or hand or something? Uh, would it be A, swelling, B, deformity, C, numbness or tingling, or D, all of the above? So which of the following would you expect to be to, to have as a sign of a sprain. Swelling, A. 
B, deformity, C, numbness or tingling, or D, all of the above. Got a bunch of answers already. So we got A from DJ, A from Gizzard. Uh, then DJ changed his answer. A from Jacob and D from Roy and from Jacob again. So you can change your answers if you want, but I'm going to take the first actual answer always, and that'll be Roy. So uh, yeah, it's all of the above. Uh, not always a deformity, but it'll swell and look goofy, right? It'll look all lumpy and stuff, but a sprain is typically uh, damage enough that you're going to start seeing some, some indications and usually more than your typical bruise or something like that. And definitely a lot of pain. We didn't put that in here. So uh, put some equal signs in here. The next one is, man, this is another boring one. Let's go to the next one. What's the proper way to clean a wound? I personally find immobilization stuff boring. So there was like three or four broken limb and immobilization stuff, and that's just boring. So I went to the next one. What is a proper way to clean a wound? Uh, here we go. A, use soap and water to clean the wound. B, rinse the room with alcohol or hydrogen peroxide. C, apply a mixture of vinegar and baking soda to the wound. Or D, none of the above. So what's the proper way to clean a wound? Again, this is in a wilderness situation in an in a, in a austere circumstance. Uh, what's the proper way to clean? You, a, use soap and water. B, rinse it with alcohol or hydrogen peroxide. Or C, apply a mixture of vinegar with baking soda. Or D, none of the above. Proper way to clean. We're getting some answers. DJ started with irrigate and then, which is a good answer for almost everything. And then uh, A is his first answer. Roy said B. G23 said B. A couple of people saying alcohol or hydrogen peroxide. Jacob and, and Geyser are saying D. Here's a quick answer. Never use hydrogen peroxide. That's like old wise tale. It's really bad for stuff and you never want to get it in you. So it's good for like cleaning the outside of things sometimes, but alcohol is pretty caustic and hydrogen peroxide, they're both going to kill cells. If we're trying to help people, let's not kill cells if we can help it. So soap and water is the way to go. You can get some betadine and stuff, some of the surgical soaps, which are really good. And you can get those at like Walgreens. So uh, spindle soap and water is the way to go. Having some powdered soap maybe, but uh, I don't know, when you guys said none of the above, I'm guessing you had something else, maybe irrigation or something, but um, soap is good too. So the best way to clean a wound is to use soap and water, remove dirt and debris, uh, use, avoid using alcohol and hydrogen peroxide as these can damage the tissue. So it's pretty much what I said. All right, so um, another one that you may or may not have to deal with, but you can be, you, this one can sneak up on you. Let's put it that way. You don't have to live where I live to deal with the next question. What is the treatment for a heat stroke? Is it uh, to A, give the person fluids and allow them to rest in the shade? Is it B, apply ice to the affected area? Is it C, to keep the person warm and dry? Or D, none of the above? So what is the treatment for a heat stroke? Is it give the person fluids and allow them to rest in the shade? B, uh, apply ice to the affected area. C, keep the person warm and dry. Or D, none of these. All right, we got a bunch of them here. So lawyers are breast for debrading. Shade, water. Okay, so the first one is A. Then DJ saying B. Uh, G23 also A. And Gizzard is saying D. I think the none of the above... If I was listening to this, I might think about that one too. But in this one, it's A. Give the person fluids and allow them to rest in the shade. Um, I know, ideally. But, uh, I mean, I have heard some concern. Oops. I've heard some concern with uh, giving people like ice water. So I could see why someone might choose none of the above on that one. Uh, but heat stroke is a life-threatening condition. It occurs when the body overheats. Treatment involves getting a person to a cool place, giving them fluids, and seeking medical attention. One of the things I'll do is uh, put cold bottles of water or just bottles of water. You know, they don't have to be ice cold. In fact, that might be a shock to the system. So, but cold water in the armpits 
uh, is a good way to get some uh, those the the big fat blood veins going through your armpits, uh, getting them you know getting them some uh, place to move heat to, getting clothing wet is a good way too. You can uh, start to wick off a lot of the heat. All right, here's one. The creepy, I don't like to think about, but uh, what would you do or what should you do if someone is having a seizure? What should you do if someone is having a seizure? So is it A, hold the person down to prevent them from hurting themselves? Put something in their mouth to prevent them from biting their tongue? C, clear the area around them and protect their head? Or D, none of the above? So it's kind of a trick question. This is intermediate first aid, wilderness first aid. What do you do if someone's having a seizure? Hold the person down to prevent them from hurting themselves, A. B, put something in their mouths to prevent them from biting their tongue. C, clear the area around them, protect their head. Or D, none of the above. Uh, let's see, you guys are just saying we used to have cooling vests at the plant where they worked and they regulated times in hot environments. Yeah, I bet you can only go hang out with them, nuclear pools. Like you'd go swimming in a nuclear pool for a while. It's like a sauna and you'd have to come out and get in one of them cooling vests. Must have been like a fancy spa in Europe. There's a little bubbly water all over that's heated, heated by nuclear fission. Must have been a paradise. All right, so uh, what to do if someone's having a seizure? Uh, DJ is saying C. We've got a bunch of answers already. Pretty much everyone is saying C. Uh, Jacob is not, but welcome or, or well done, everyone. Definitely C. Uh, you don't want to try to hold somebody uh, when they're having it. It's going to be your tendency, but uh, it's going to be difficult. They're not rational, and they are going to hurt you. So um, it's really not possible to hold them. If you've got a big enough person and holding them and a small enough person freaking out, then it's possible, but it's really not ideal. So uh, really just to, if you wing a pillow or a pad or something underneath of them, put a blanket underneath of them, that's fine. Trying to get to their mouth, no, don't try that either. So uh, a lot of this stuff we used to see in movies all the time. There's Chris out there. Hopefully your internet's doing good. Uh, TV lied to us about holding them down for sure. Uh, not, not really. There was, if you watch, uh, the old emergency and some of the old shows, things were different back in the day. Uh, ambulances started out as hearses. You literally, the people who drove hearses around were ambulance drivers. And then they turned into vans and then they turned into the ambulances that we were familiar with. They were like a pickup truck or a van with a big box behind it. And now they're even more elaborate than that. So as the ambulances evolved, so did our practices. So think of CPR. I don't know when the first time y'all learned CPR. Just throw the year out there. You first learned CPR. I probably first learned CPR in like, shit, I don't know, like 1980 or something. Like I learned CPR a long, long time ago. And it is way different than when we first learned it. So, you know, things change. So it is true that we don't mess with people having seizures and it's different. If you have a seizure in a hospital and a bunch of nurses and doctors are there, they're going to start doing stuff. The regular people aren't going to do because they're familiar with it and they know their resources that they've got available to them right there. Oh yeah. I can definitely guarantee you that one. Um, let's see. So then we'll keep going. Um, let me see how much time do we got. We got about 22 minutes before the mouse party, which is an overnight show run by Foss, who is uh, a host extraordinaire with uh, Baron, and they uh, run a topic-free conversation on Wednesdays. All right, so the next question is, uh, what's the proper way to splint a broken bone? What's the proper way to splint a broken bone. Um, a, immobilize the area with a rigid object. B, apply ice to the affected area. 
C, massage the affected area to increase blood flow, or D, none of the above. Oh, Pascal is saying for CPR, uh, the what is it? The uh, Bee Gees tune, "Staying Alive." If you think of the the chorus of that song, "Staying Alive, Staying Alive," blah 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 blah, "Staying Alive," right? That's the pace that you want to do CPR. Your compressions on CPR is uh, "Staying Alive." So you just got to remember the Bee Gees, and you save people's lives. All right, so what was the proper way to splint the broken bone? Is it A, immobilize the affected area with a rigid object, B, apply ice to the affected area, C, massage the area to increase blood flow, or D, none of the above? And we got a bunch of answers. Pretty much everybody, no, we got an A, and then an A from DJ, G23 put in D, none of the above. Gizzard put in D, which is his go-to answer. Uh, hatchet time in Civil War, maybe. So uh, can you imagine somebody trying to massage the area? Like, oh, you've got a compound fracture? I'm pretty sure I'm supposed to massage that. <laughs> it wouldn't last very long, but it would definitely be a humorous comic or something. But in reality, you want to immobilize and uh, splint. So uh, immobilize the affected area with a rigid object. Uh, in other words, make it so that the broken bone doesn't move. So that the person, if they have to, can move. But ideally, they're going to lay on a stretcher or something. They're going to lay down. And you're going to have that thing immobilized so that the limb doesn't move. And trust me, they're going to do everything they can do to make sure that that limb doesn't move. Once they get them somewhere, they get some painkillers. Then they'll start moving it around and figuring out what's going on. But most broken bones aren't going to, you're not going to kill you. Uh, sometimes they can, but most of the time... They're just going to be broken and hurt a lot. So the best thing you can do is immobilize them, get the person to some place where they can do something about it. Um, so something like a board or even a magazine uh, can be wrapped around it. And then uh, shirts and other things can be used so that you're not actually putting the broken bone on the rigid object or trying to con conform the bone, you know, the arm or the limb or whatever to the object. Uh-oh, this one going to be... Uh, this one's going to be tough, so I don't even know how to say this hardly. So this is intermediate wilderness first aid. I'm going to put it here, and then I'm going to try to say it. What should you do if someone is experiencing anaphylaxis? What should you do if someone is experiencing anaphylaxis? Would you A, give them water to drink? Would you B, apply ice to the affected area? Would you C, administer epinephrine with an auto-injector, or D, none of the above? So what would you do if someone's experiencing anaphylaxis? So this is intermediate. This is your little baby first aid class that they give to little babies, like this little puppy right here. Uh, do you A, give them water, B, apply ice, C, administer epinephrine, or D, none of the above? Oh, Gizzard is given an answer this time. We got a whole bunch of C's and one D. So the first C was DJ, and it is in fact administer epinephrine with an auto injector. Anaphylaxis is a severe allergic reaction that can be life threatening. Treatment involves administering epinephrine with an auto injector and seeking medical attention. Giving them water and ice would not address the underlying condition. So which of the following is a sign of hypothermia? A little bit easier. Something you're definitely going to encounter. I mean, definitely going to encounter as a wilderness EMT. And probably just anybody that goes hunting or goes out with people that are idiots. Which of the following is a sign of hypothermia? A, warm and dry skin. B, rapid breathing. C, slow pulse. Or D, none of the above. Uh, let's see. Not everybody has EpiPens. People who have allergic reactions typically have the EpiPen. So that's why they almost always say a self-injector. Uh, I think nowadays EMTs get EpiPens in their kit and 
paramedics have always been able to administer that as a drug. But um, typically, you're instructed as a first aid person that the person who needs it is going to have their own allergic reaction drugs. And what you can do, well, back in the day when I was an EMT, all you could do is go, hey, you got a pen? And then when they pointed at it, you could do something about it. But you could go, hey, you got a pen? But I couldn't do nothing about it. I have to watch them get puffy. Um, paramedic could come over and jab them with a pen, but they don't just give you pens. Now, in reality, people that have to deal with that stuff have extra pens, and they usually can give a pen to their friends or their spouse or something. So you can get, you can get those pens. Uh, let's see. So the one was, what are the following signs or which of the following is a sign of hyperthermia? So we got DJ with a C. We got Roy with a B, rapid breathing. Uh, G23 with a C. Gizzard with a none of the above, his old standby. Woods with an A. Um, and then none or all. So which of the following is, uh, and the answer is C, slow pulse. Hypothermia occurs when the body's core temperature drops below normal. So the signs of hypothermia include slow breathing, not rapid breathing, slow pulse, and then cool and clammy skin, and they're going to be confused. Uh, yeah, you start getting crazy with hypothermia. Um, so let's see. That one is going to go to DJ. Slow pulse. All right, so next up is mm, okay, we're going to go with this one because this one will have some controversy. It's going to be very controversial. I don't want anybody to fight with each other over this one or hold any grudges over this one. So, what happened? What is the proper way to treat a minor burn? What is the proper way to treat a minor burn? Uh, a, apply the ice to the affected area. B, cover the burn with a bandage. Uh, C, hold the affected area under cool running water. Or D, none of the above. So which is the proper way to treat a minor burn? to apply ice, to cover it, to hold it under cold water. Got about another 15 minutes or so, a little bit less till the mouse party. Got about another 15 minutes or so, a little bit less till the mouse party. Thanks. I just deleted that character, that person. So uh, thanks for uh, deleting all that for me. Um, we got CCCC, which is hold it under cold water. Well played. DJ got it first, though. So I don't know what's up with that. DJ is definitely the most tactical and the most first aid-ish out of everybody out here. Uh, when treating a minor burn, it's important to cool the affected area with cool water for at least 10 minutes. Do not apply ice or ointments or cover the burn with a sterile bandage. So um, I think the ice is just a waste of time, right? And you can uh, do better without looking for the ice, personally. Let's see. Remove a splinter. That one's pretty lame. How about we do the bee sting? What is the treatment for a bee sting? Again, I don't want any animosity or hard feelings with people. Uh, is it A, apply vinegar to the affected area? B, apply a cold compress to the affected area. C, apply a warm compress to the affected area. Or the gizzard option, none of the above. What's the best way to, for the treatment of a bee sting? Oops, I'm on the wrong one. Bee sting. So is it A, apply vinegar. B, cold compress. C, warm compress. Or D, None of the above. DJ is saying B, cold compress. Gizzard is saying C, none of the above. And that's the only answers we're getting. Everybody else would be dumbfounded. What if it's a killer bee? Then what do you do? 
So the answer is, in fact, kind of makes sense, B, cold compress. Uh, it's important to remove the stinger and apply a cold compress to reduce the swelling. Do not apply vinegar. That can make the pain worse. And warm is just going to allow blood flow more. You want us to kind of restrict the blood flow. Let me try this one, see what people think about this one. Again, it's going to be controversial. I know people have, no, don't put vinegar on there. Um, the, uh, this is going to be controversial. What is the proper way to treat a nosebleed? Is it A, tilt the head back and apply pressure to the nostrils? B, tilt the head forward and apply pressure to the bridge of the nose? C, apply ice to the affected area, or D, none of the above. So there's different ways of doing this for sure. Is it A, tilt the head back, B, tilt the head forward and the bridge of the nose, sorry, tilt the head back and nostrils, tilt the head forward and bridge, or apply ice, or none of these things. Gizzard's going with the with the D. Moo is tilting the head back. DJ tilting the head back. Anybody else? So nobody wins this one. According to the internet, you want to push your head forward. All right, next up, let's, one is important, although it's not so much wilderness, which of the following are signs of a heart attack? Which of the following are signs of a heart attack? A, chest pain that goes away after a few minutes. B, shortness of breath while resting. C, no, nausea and vomiting. Or D, none of these. Which of the following? Or signs of a heart attack. Chest pain that never goes or that goes away after a few minutes. B shortness of breast breath while resting. Or C nausea and vomiting. Or D none of the above. So we've got a couple answers. We've got DJ with the B, Gizzard with the C, and Roy taking the none of the above. I mean, there are definitely other indications of a heart attack and there's more symptoms than this. But once again, Dr. DJ with the shortness of breath while resting, uh, a heart attack occurs when blood flow to the heart is blocked. Signs of that can include chest pain or discomfort that lasts more than a few minutes, right? Stays with you. Shortness of breath, Nausea, lightheadedness, and sweating, but all of those while you stop, you know, you sit down and all that. Left arm tingles, yep. I haven't heard of the copper taste, but I'm sure that could be a thing too. There you go. That's a good strategy. We're about seven minutes to 42 seconds away. At this point, DJ has effectively slaughtered everyone out here with his tactical prowess and his medical knowledge. Luckily for all of you people who got slaughtered by DJ tonight, he is also kind and able to provide medical attention for all of you. So those of you who had strokes from being wailed on by him, those of you who got burned from wailing on, getting wailed on by DJ, those of you that are having heart issues and sitting there with shortness of breath, DJ will in turn come up to each and every one of you and treat with the appropriate response and then give you a little bit of tactical wisdom to set you off on your way. We recommend that you head over to the mouse party, which is a, an amazing experience every single Wednesday. You will not be the same after experiencing it. Um, with that, thanks everybody for joining us. We do a tactical quiz every Wednesday. Tomorrow we'll be talking tra training and, and uh, travel. 
On Friday, we wrap up the week by taking a look at what other people have done. We build that show during the workshop. So uh, on Friday afternoons, I'm doing the workshop. Uh, we've been sewing patches. So if you jump over to our other channel, uh, we're sewing patches. We've got the new machine. Uh, if you're one of the people that helped us get the new machine, uh, put up a menu so you can go start grabbing some uh, items for, for your, as your uh, perks from that project. Otherwise, thanks everybody for joining us for another edition of our Daily Gun Show. And uh, we'll be back tomorrow. If you have any uh, questions or comments, please leave them in the description of the video. Appreciate everybody that joins us live. And DJ will have will get what's coming to him for winning tonight. That's for sure. All right. Thanks, everybody. We will be back to pick you up later. Cheat. Ninja? Ninja? Ninja?